So the post break, the next session is on the global development in hydrogen based mobility. And for this, we have uh, a moderator. This, this session will be moderated by uh, uh, Professor Arvind. Uh, Professor Arvind, I'll uh, so please take over from here. And uh, all our four uh, speakers have joined this, and we have made into presenters. Uh, Professor Arvind. So uh, yeah, good afternoon. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So all our four speakers uh, have joined already. So we can start this session. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, this session, we have um, we have presentations uh, from from um, uh, to start with uh, Mr. Uh, Prasant Kiroy, uh, senior director from FTA Consulting on global experience of adsorp uh, adoption of hydrogen fuel cell uh, transportation system. But then we will uh, 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 we will move on to experiences from uh, uh, fuel cell buses and um, and then fuel cell in commercial freight operations. And the final presentation will be on potential uh, of uh, of hydrogen fuel cell buses in India and experience in Japan. So we have four presentations, and uh, the the first presentation to start with is as I have said before from Mr. Prasant Kiroi, Senior Director of FTA Consulting. And FTA Consulting is the Secretariat for India Hydrogen Alliance, under which FTA has started has published a report on India's energy transition towards a green hydrogen economy in December 2020. This research proposes a target of 4% hydrogen energy in India's energy mix by year 2030, and also discusses 10 national development uh, stage projects. The research covers a wide spectrum of recommendations that include policy measures, funding mechanisms, and public-private partnerships to build a robust manufacturing position for India in the emerging global hydrogen supply chain to help decarbonize key sectors. Um, so today we have uh, with us Mr. Prasanto K. Roy, a public policy and technology, public policy technology and media professional. He's a senior director at FTA Consulting, Washington uh, DC based advisory, and uh, is a part of the India Hydrogen Council Secretariat at FTA. So, uh, uh, Mr. Prashant uh, Kiroi, uh, you're most welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I hope you can see my slides. So, I'll keep this short uh, uh, because uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, there is a lot of ground that has been covered in recent sessions, and more is going to be covered in this session itself, including some of the case studies that I'm mentioning. Uh, I see that some of uh, you know my colleagues on the panel are actually from the companies that I'm mentioning. I'm going to be mentioning here, so uh, I'll keep this really short and maybe uh, look at question and answers. If so, you know, in terms of although uh, I'm not deep diving into India, uh, I think one challenge we are seeing in India is is of course the scale, and at this scale, it is chicken and egg. You know, our our pilots and all are really in the range of. Some of them are in the works. Some of them are, you know, five, ten kind of buses. There are fifteen buses. Tata Motors uh, has done this conversion of the Star Bus, or you know, creation of a, a fuel cell electric vehicle around the Star Bus. Uh, NTPC looking at a pilot in Delhi. Uh, but let's jump to some of the global, and you know, compared with this, and we'll just see how you know scale has actually uh being arrived at and is being arrived at with certain targets in mind targets like for example the winter olympics in beijing uh in the next year so china um 10000 hydrogen trucks and buses uh in at the end of 2020 its hydrogen consumption is second after the us uh I think in all of these in China is of course you know uh, in in most other cases we'll see strong examples of public private partnership and uh, in China too you would see that except that the large entities which are there which are the large enterprises are typically state owned enterprises uh, but even so I think that collaboration is is sort of visible there so you look at uh, whether Zhengzhou public transport you know uh, small relatively small by china standards you know 30 hydrogen buses in in place by june 2020 but uh, zhangjiaqu uh, which is you know kind of not too far from beijing uh, is what is you know the central hub of their the beijing winter olympics plan of you know between 1000 and 2000 depending on where you look i mean it's well over 1000 
uh, fuel cell vehicles, which will be largely buses and you know maybe smaller buses. Um, for this, they've uh, Shell has been Shell has been commissioned to Shell is putting in place a 20 megawatt electrolyzer, some of which is which is active, 16 uh, stations. So clearly, I mean, a huge part of this whole thing is is the ecosystem, and we've seen. I think we heard in the last session how much of a challenge it is actually uh, putting this in place because it's not very easy to uh, transport cryogenic hydrogen, even though it's at it's at low pressure. It's very capital intensive, but uh, you know, 165 bar or up to 200 bar kind of transportation that uh, you know we are predominantly looking at here is. Uh, it get, gets very expensive beyond a certain uh, point simply because you know you're transporting what I think 20,000 kilograms of steel for 200 or 300 kgs of hydrogen as we heard in the uh, of uh, you know gaseous hydrogen. But uh, those are the things so uh, you know going forward we will probably see a mix of you know fairly distributed uh, hydrogen generation because the thing about green hydrogen is it doesn't really need much in terms of input except energy and water. Uh, and which is why, for example, the in the previous slide, the NTPC example, uh, you know, one is in lay. So there's five buses looking at lay because, you know, you've got solar energy there. So solar energy and water uh, and, uh, you know, you're, you're pretty much set. Of course, it's not that easy. You have a lot of, uh, you know, there's this capital equipment and so on. So um, China is at the stage where it has actually got plans like, you know, uh, Nanjing, uh, has got a now an aggressive plan to replace its 7,000 electric vehicle bus fleet with hydrogen powered vehicles. So we are, of course, here we are not at the stage where we have an electric vehicle bus fleet. So this is maybe a generation or so ahead. But it's really interesting to look at that in terms of scale. And then, of course, see what are the learnings from there and what are the learnings from elsewhere. And elsewhere, I think the only other one I will go a little deeper into because lack of time is Scotland. Uh, where Aberdeen City Council, so you know they have again this year, early this year, they kicked off with 15 zero emission double decker buses, hydrogen buses, and I don't think there are hydrogen double deckers anywhere. London is looking at uh, you know bringing them in, but as of now, it's it's Aberdeen. They have 25 of them at this point. Once again, it's a very strong public-private partnership. Uh, project lead is Aberdeen City Council. You know, uh, so uh, that's probably a strong case in point to look at for uh, as far as Kochi, for example, is concerned. You know, the Kerala government is looking at a uh, setup like this. You know, this is part funded by EU's Jive uh, project, which is aimed at commercializing hydrogen buses. And there are lots of cities to follow across the United Kingdom, London, Birmingham and others. Um, I won't get into the details of the buses, but you know clearly there's a very strong example, and I would urge people here and and you know Kerala government and so on to really look at the Aberdeen example. Uh, the China example is scary in the sense of scale, etc. There's also a very overwhelming directive which is at the central level because a lot of this planning is central, even though it's executed at the at the municipal levels and so on. For instance, the alignment with Beijing Olympics. But Aberdeen, Scotland, I think is a very great case in point to look at. Uh, in terms of freight, I won't go deeper into this. I think we have Hazon Motors uh, on the uh, panel, so we'll probably hear a lot more. Uh, but uh, at present, I mean, essentially, uh, like uh, Hazon, you know, others looking at trucking initially in the in the absence of a hydrogen refueling network, you're looking at either you know return to base kind of operations or places where you clearly have a strong network on both ends. You know, if it is kind of mid range, if not true long haul. Uh, OK, uh, Chile is another one which is, uh, you know, uh, the United States is is right now on top in terms of hydrogen uh, consumption for uh, transportation. But Chile is really working on mining. There's mining is pretty big there. So there's a lot of work in developing mining trucks and, you know, hope to make mining a very strong part of uh, the Chile, uh, Chile's game plan for uh, renewable energy and hydrogen. Uh, shipping, I'll touch upon this briefly, but you know, I think this is an example of where, uh, so this sh in shipping, hydrogen is a problem. Transporting, I mean, uh, uh, gaseous hydrogen out of the question, you'd be spending the entire weight of the ship, you know, with for the steel. Cryogenics is going to require a lot of capital, a lot of space again, 
so ammonia is actually the alternative which is looked at here. And I'm mentioning this in the context of Kerala because Kerala actually has a strong shipbuilding uh, you know, tradition, the Kochi shipyard. And I'll come, I'll end with one example from there. But uh, in this example, it's not really direct ammonia fuel cells. So that's one alternative to hydrogen FCEV, which is hydrogen fuel cells, yeah. direct ammonia fuel cells. But uh, yeah. here it is, it's really ammonia which is being used as a fuel to replace. Sorry, was there a question or an intervention? Uh, well, three, um, I think time, uh, please, please. Okay, uh, fair enough. Yeah. All right. So I'll just wrap up. Commercial vehicles, I think we will probably hear a little more on the panel. Uh, trains we have already covered. And I'll just end with this, that I think Kerala is positioned potentially to be to take up this white space, which is there in India uh, for a variety of reasons, which will not be purely around the use case of a few buses in Kochi or another place, but the potential of a hydrogen valley hub around, say, Kanji Kode or Kochi, the Kochi shipbuilding and so on. That's it. Thanks. Happy to take up questions later. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prasanto uh, Roy, and uh, very interesting presentation. And the next presentation is about uh, OEM experience of hydrogen fuel cell-based uh, buses uh, from Dr. Henning uh, Heppena, Managing Director of ELO Mobility uh, GmbH uh, from Germany. So uh, Mr. He uh, Heppena, uh, yeah, now um, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, <clears throat> good afternoon from Germany, from Berlin. My name is Henning Heppner. I tried to share my screen. Let's see if that works. Um, so now it should be visible. Um, yes, uh, my title is OEM experience and um, we are not a classical OEM in a way that we sell directly to the operator. We see ourselves more as a technology platform and in this, we also work together, for instance, with Indian uh, OEM, coach builder, body builder, in order to implement our platform into local vehicles. And that's our positioning. Our experience in this context of um, hydrogen powered um, vehicles is the following. We are concentrating on city buses. And um, the question is not only, of course, how to make it emission free, but how to enable a business model for the operator. And in this context, as a vehicle kind of uh, company, it's always difficult because we are not only talking then about the vehicle, but also about the ecosystem as such. Um, I think I repeat uh, the things that many people before me say, but if you look at the producer and the, and the provider of technical solutions, it's a quite complex system, not only to provide the product, but also a whole ecosystem. And in this context, um, we see a clear business case for uh, hydrogen powered buses because the range requirements are uh, 400 kilometers if you want to cover 95% of the range requirements of a fleet. So this is a, there's a clear de demand. Second thing is when we talk with our customers, the question is clearly not only how to provide the bus, but also what the whole ecosystem looks like and how to get the green hydrogen to the to the bus. So we are talking about the whole sector coupling question here. And the, the question is always how to achieve an optimized uh, total cost of ownership in this context. So we are talking always about the whole ecosystem. In order to achieve that, I think we have to talk always about two things. The first is a vehicle, and this is our core focus as a vehicle producer or vehicle technology platform, which is then the uh, vehicle energy management. I call it always a sector coupling on wheels because here we are talking about the combination of uh, fuel cell battery and the motor and also, of course, to fulfill the driver's wish. And this is what we call vehicle uh, energy management. But we are not only talking about one vehicle, we are always talking about the whole fleet. So the context is also to optimize the operation of the whole fleet. So how do we do it? Um, when we go into this business case, we are actually able to model the whole uh, supply chain coming from the right side from the operation demand uh, where we have a fleet and uh, uh, hydrogen consumption demand that is uh, not only the total amount of hydrogen but also of course the profile uh, of such a demand so and then from the fleet we go to the vehicle and to the h2 supply and we are actually able to modulate the whole um, the whole uh, well-to-wheel kind of scenario in our model. And it looks like that. 
that we are really able in our online tool to simulate wherever in the world data are uh, available. We are able to um, simulate a route and the route stops, uh, starts and stops somewhere and has certain um, a certain elevation profile. It has a cert certain traffic uh, profile, et cetera, et cetera. So in this context, we are able to actually simulate such a um, profile to come up with a vehicle that could then um, actually uh, fulfill such a demand with minimum consumption. And that is something that we are actually doing. And in order to do that, and not only to plan it, but also to implement it, um, we see our core competence here to really be smart in this uh, energy consumption uh, profile. And uh, this is the, the uh, for instance, a typical a profile that we have to match because here we can see a route and we can see a profile of an end uh, of a battery SOC together with a fuel cell operation. And our core competence and our core focus is how to operate a vehicle in an optimized mode. First, to optimize fuel consumption, but not only at a given point of time, but also over lifetime, because the question is not only to achieve such optimized consumption on one day, but also over lifetime of com components because it is uh, the fact that the battery and the fuel cell are the cost drivers of such a vehicle and we want them to operate over eight or more years uh, in a healthy state. And that is what we do. And this is our core um, focus. Our vehicle that we designed and um, where we are now in the prototype phase with the SOP 2022 is a modular bus design where we are able to even enable um, smaller volume productions with a modular design because we have certain uh, different requirements of vehicle length and vehicle equipment and we are able to fulfill such a demand with our approach and down on the right side you see a typical let's say frame of a bus with a hydrogen tanks on the top with a battery in the back together with a fuel cell and the motor more in the middle in order to balance the whole um, weight of the bus. So the message here is we are able to, and we are believe that we are able to uh, support a business model for operators in a context of a typical city bus requirement of a fleet operation. We would like to work together and we are uh, in discussion with Indian partners to implement our technology because we are able to um, to fulfill requirements in terms of local sourcing and also um, the uh, typical requirements of optimizing a vehicle together with the ecosystem. And for us, the chicken and egg situation does not really exist because we always believe the chicken in this context is a vehicle with the requirements and then the infrastructure can be um, built up accordingly and like we all or already said the local uh, hydro green hydrogen supply is not such a difficult thing as such because you only need energy and water and it is possible and we see a clear uh, future for hydrogen in such um, city bus requirement and profile that was my presentation i'm open for any questions or comments um thank you uh... Mr. Hepner, uh, I guess the, the original plan is, is to have all the questions and answers um, uh, at the end of the session. But I think uh, your, your presentation is very, 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 very much interesting because it's not only about uh, designing and operating a bus, but managing the fleet efficiently. And all your experience, I think 20 years or more uh, in, 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 in developing the systems, but also uh, in working together with, for example, Fraunhofer Institute for Transport and Infrastructure, uh, that's very important because any new emerging technology, the companies and, and uh, uh, entrepreneurs need to, to work together with knowledge institutes probably well uh, as, as the technologies and the systems are developing. So thank you very much for, for your very interesting presentation. And I think we will come back to the questions at the end of the session. Is that okay? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, since you mentioned Fraunhofer, yeah, it's very important for us because they come um, with the support of 20 years of experience in simulating also the bus and uh, the different environments uh, together with the infrastructure. And they help us in uh, to, to get this data for uh, comparison of our simulation with the real-time data experience and also then close the loop between planning, operation, and then feedback into the next generation of optimization. Thank you. 
Thank you. We'll come back to the question and session uh, later. So uh, the next presentation is from uh, Mr. Uh, Murugang Inanda from Heisen Motors. I'm very happy that Heisen Motors is also here because I teach at the University of Groningen in Netherlands and uh, Heisen Motors is starting up one of their largest uh, truck building facilities in, in, in Groningen. And it's, it's expected to, uh, to start up in a couple of months from now. And if I understand correctly, the, the company is even planning to recruit 300 people from the region. So um, uh, I need a known name for us in, in, in Groningen in Netherlands now. And I'm happy to have Heisen on board here. And uh, Mr. Uh, Murgan Kanandar has 15 years of experience in clean technology and renewable sector. He's also head of the development of for Asia region at Heisen Motors. And Heisen Motors is a global supplier of zero emission hydrogen fuel cell powered commercial vehicles that include heavy duty trucks, buses, and coaches. So, um, uh, Mr. Ananda, uh, you're most welcome to present your views. Thank you. I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, ju just a small correction. So uh, I'm, I'm responsible for Middle East as well, in addition to Asia. So uh, a couple of the examples I'll try and bring to, to bear today uh, will hopefully have uh, something to do with the Middle East as well. Uh, but anyway, here we go. Uh, very, very happy to be here. Thank you to Professor Arvind and, and to the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, let me quickly go into the, the five minute, let's say, presentation I have in mind. Uh, look, first and foremost, um, you know, let, let me not stress too much on the high zone side of this presentation, but I think what is important is that uh, we are really dealing with a a 20 year old technology uh, that that is the DNA of high zone in particular. So uh, we, we are very happy uh, with that. Uh, the focus is very much on the commercial market and uh, within Hyzon, I think the focus is very, very strongly on TCO, uh, you know, applications where the TCO makes sense. We, we don't like to focus on every single application that is available because, uh, frankly, these are the early days for the industry and uh, we, we have to be uh, focused on uh, opportunities that make us all look good and, and not on you know, every potential off taker who's interested in the new technology. Um, and, and, and that's kind of been where we are focused uh, as, as high zone. Um, additionally, I will quickly add that we are uh, looking at examples from across the world because high zone is already uh, delivering to, to customers in Europe, uh, in the Middle East, in the US, and also in Australia. Uh, so, in fact, uh, the the earlier truck, the beautiful truck that uh, Prasanto uh, showed earlier was uh, a truck that I also have in my presentation and it's being uh, uh, delivered or it has already been delivered to Friesland Campina in uh, in the Netherlands uh, and, and the facility that uh, that of course uh, Professor Arvind mentioned uh, just right now uh, it, it's partially active already so we are still we are already at a capacity of almost uh, 1500 trucks uh, per annum uh, but we are still in the process of scaling up to full capacity and and as you rightly mentioned we will uh, hire uh, 300 and, and hopefully even more uh, uh, of the you know best engineers and, and technicians and so on uh, in this facility um, the other quick thing to add here, I mean, excluding or, or ignoring the experience management team point, is that this commercial uh, fuel cell electric mobility market is, is going to grow exponentially. So it's expected to grow by 34% uh, annually for the next almost 10 years, and, and that's phenomenal. Um, a quick comment again on what Hyzon focuses on, because it's extremely relevant to this talk. Uh, only on medium to heavy duty commercial vehicles. So we only focus on medium to heavy duty trucks. We also look at buses. We, we have a complete portfolio of vehicles that uh, that caters to, to different applications in, in this category. Uh, the reason for it is actually quite clear. The, the top right that we see, as, as was already mentioned by other speakers, is, is feasible perhaps with ammonia, perhaps with uh, liquid hydrogen. It, it's some, uh, some time away. Uh, with airplanes as well, we have a similar sort of uh, development cycle uh, with additional concerns around safety, et cetera, as you can imagine. Uh, the bottom left is is where, uh, you know, if, if fuel cell technology becomes cheaper and hydrogen becomes even cheaper, more abundantly available with a network of refueling stations, it may work. The, the middle portion, which is where Hyzon is focused, is actually commercial mobility. And uh, it does not depend so much on a network of refueling stations. Rather, we depend on a back-to-base model, uh, large fleets uh, and, and large uh, deployments in that sense. Uh, and, and that allows for us to, to solve the chicken and egg problem for a single customer or for a single hub. We, we don't try and solve it for an entire region. We don't try and solve it for an entire state. Uh, and, and that uh, is the model that we've chosen to follow. 
Uh, I can completely skip this si slide, but again, to think about freight and, and commercial mobility and, and trucking, uh, it's important to note that batteries are not a viable uh, option for the for the heavier duty ones. Uh, again, I'm not knocking batteries. Uh, fuel cell electric vehicles use batteries. Uh, I'm simply talking about 100% uh, battery vehicles versus FC EVs. And FC EVs have significant advantages where it comes to faster refueling, better range, uh, we are not restricted to the grid because, you know, the, normally you're only as green as a grid if you're dealing with battery electric vehicles. And finally, the weight is the biggest issue. Uh, battery electric vehicles have five to eight tons of uh, of battery weight for uh, a super heavy duty, you know, 40 ton plus truck. Uh, while we could, uh, you know, have basically less than two tons or two and a half tons of battery weight. So we are really shaving off a fair bit of the payload capacity and the volume of, of the vehicle. Um, I think, again, I don't want to think of this as a, as a marketing slide for Hyzon. I think the key thing to add here is, again, to get the TCO to work. Uh, the, the leasing or the full service option is, is very, very critical. Uh, we can't only think in terms of uh, vehicle sales as an industry. Uh, you know, it, it's, I, I will bring out a com comparable example later on in this presentation, but, uh, but it, it's important to note that we have to figure out a way to convert the upfront cost into a sort of operating cost for clients. Um, I quickly added this slide into the presentation because of a of couple of the things that were already discussed. So uh, A, Hyzon has already been doing this for about three years uh, through our parent company. So the bottom left and, and middle two trucks that you see are, are through the technology provided by our parent company, which is Horizon, on the fuel cell uh, stack side. Uh, our top left uh, truck is actually manufactured, assembled in Groningen. And we have also we are also looking at buses. So in that sense, uh, you know, the bus that you see in the center here is is a bus that was delivered to uh, to uh, a mining sector client in Australia for Disq Metals. Um, again, some pictures of uh, applications and and trucks. So you can see here already a, a refuse uh, processing truck. We have also been part of the Aberdeen project. We have supplied um, you know the the waste disposal or refuse collecting trucks. Uh, which are based off uh, a Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, Econic platform. On the top right, you see the uh, the basic sort of tractor. It can be used for a number of applications. Uh, you can put anything at the back, in other words. The same thing, uh, bottom left, uh, you know, that's Iconic uh, US-based uh, Freightliner platform, again, a Mercedes platform. Uh, and, and bottom right, you see some of uh, the tanker-style applications, the same, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, example that, uh, that an earlier speaker, uh, Prasanto, uh, had shared. Um, and, and that's, again, long-haul uh, milk transportation. So we could think of any liquids, et cetera. Again, in India, you often see that even with water. So there are several applications one can imagine. Um, we are also, we are really solving for long range and uh, heavy duty. So we are doing everything up to 150 plus tons. You know, fuel cell electric mobility can solve problems at the heaviest duty end of the spectrum. Uh, we are also looking at liquid hydrogen. So we are working with Chart Industries to to uh, to have liquid hydrogen for you know a thousand plus miles, so 1,200, 1,400 mile uh, range, uh, sorry kilometer range on a, on a truck. Uh, and and of course uh, we are also looking at ways to innovate on storage uh, with existing stories. Uh, as I said, again for commercial mobility to really make sense, we must focus on the complete picture. Uh, so that includes the after sales, it includes the vehicle, but it also includes the hydrogen. Uh, that's what we try and do. And uh, there are a couple of interesting solutions uh, which are uh, available for a bottom-up solution for, for green hydrogen. So in addition to what Prasanto mentioned, which was uh, electrolyzers, which is water plus renewables, in, in, in some cases, you can also start with waste, you can start with uh, uh, biogas, et cetera, and you can have even cheaper hydrogen than, uh, than uh, other alternatives. Uh, Hyzon is actually invested into this. So we, are, uh, we have three or four key partnerships and investments through which we, we deliver uh, green hydrogen projects. Um, a quick comment. Look, uh, India, cost sensitivity, not a big surprise to anyone here. Uh, there's a lower cost base with local uh, manufacturers and assemblers. Uh, range requirements are important. Uh, and if you go for long range without a truck that can do long range, then you need to think of network considerations. Uh, refueling networks take time. It, it's, uh, it's also quite difficult. Uh, then quickly to add, uh, you know, in India, smaller trucks may be better because, uh, you know, roads are not always as wide, uh, especially in Kerala, in, in some of the southern states. Uh, these are very densely populated areas. Uh, I mentioned TCO already, so let me skip it. Cost of financing is part of TCO. Uh, you know, it's not just the upfront cost. We also have to think in terms of amortizing that cost through effective financing. 
the comparison here is with renewables, you know, 10, 15 years back when uh, you had a higher capex but lower opex. Uh, FC EVs are similar. Uh, we have to play on the lower operating cost angle, but uh, for that, you have to also amortize the high upfront cost. Um, subsidies, again, I can slightly skip this. I am sure this has been covered by others. Uh, and, and part to early adoption, why buy today or why adopt today instead of two years down the line? It's because you need to get comfortable with the technology. You need to solve for regulation. You need to solve for uh, for uh, infrastructure, etc. Um, so the, the you know starting today at a small scale perhaps is is the right way to go. And and I'm I'm very happy to see that there have been some uh, positive examples of this in India already. Uh, my final slide. So I'm trying to manage the the time. Uh, so look, what are our priorities at, in in terms of thinking of commercial freight? We have to think in terms of what applications work. As I said, not everything works. Uh, what does work, in our opinion, is our applications like ports, waste disposal, uh, mining, long haul in general. Uh, then again, how competitive and abundant is the green hydrogen supply? Uh, one thing to quickly warn about here is, you know, production cost is not delivered cost. Uh, you produce uh, at $2, uh, 5,000 kilometers away from where you actually consume it. By the time you get it, by the time you compress it, it's still $12, $15 a kilo, so it doesn't help. I would much rather produce at $4 and sell at 5 if it's possible. Uh, then there's a question of you know production strategy versus hydrogen vehicle or mobility play. Often the green hydrogen production projects that we see are extremely large scale, and that's not that's going to be too large for mobility. What I like personally with mobility is a decentralized network of, of production hubs. They can be small. They can be producing hydrogen competitively. Like I said, you don't have to target the $1, $2. You can be at $4. That's already competitive enough. And of course, the other question, which is slightly controversial, is does it does the hydrogen production have to be green? Uh, we would love it, yes. Uh, sometimes, of course, you know, the chicken and egg problem means that you need to think of, you know, uh, whatever is available maybe is a good way to start and make sure you develop enough volume on the applications on the downstream to justify the green hydrogen infrastructure upstream. Um, then again, you know, uh, just a quick other comment, which routes work? Not everything in India is going to work. It's it's a big country. Um, you know, it's it's a... Uh, uh, if we think in terms of just replacing every diesel engine out there, it's, it's not going to be that effective. And finally, no customer I've met so far has uh, not been excited about the story here. They, are, they all love to hear about it, but none of them actually commits to buying a truck or buying a bus without knowing how we are going to service the vehicles, how we are going to manage the life cycle of the vehicles, You know whether there's a leasing solution that can be offered, etc. Um, so look, as I said, Hyzone solution is very much back to base. So we look at large fleets, large hubs. Um, if you have a requirement for 500 vehicles at a single point, then we can think in terms of refueling, et cetera, um, and, and the rest of the infrastructure effectively. There we go. Uh, sorry, uh, I think I may have rushed through it a bit, but uh, just trying to manage uh, time here. Thank you. Uh Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nanda. Very, very, very interesting presentation. And I think also very relevant. And um, so now let's have the next speaker uh, from, from Toyota. Uh, well, uh, as we all know, Toyota is, uh, has been uh, um, uh, championing the cost of hydrogen. And especially now after introducing uh, electric vehicles in the market, uh, one of the, the front runners in the past, uh, knowing uh, where to position hydrogen vehicles um, perfectly. And also Toyota even I think uh, uh, decided to open up some of the of the of the uh, patents, etc., to to speed up uh, the technology development. So it's a very interesting um, uh, group to hear from. And Mr. Uh, Sudeep Dalvi uh, will uh, will uh, present today, and he is a, a senior vice president and director of technical uh, and chief communication officer at Toyota Kiloska Motor. He has 33 years of experience in automotive sector and has experience in domains of manufacturing, quality control, new car projects, engineering. And Toyota has been actively exploring the use of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, and they have launched a hydrogen fuel cell powered passenger car called New Mirai. Toyota is also working on transferring the fuel cell technology to heavy duty vehicles such as buses and trucks. In addition to this, Toyota is also working on developing, a, developing hydrogen engine technologies. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Dalvi, um, uh, Please present your views. Okay, thank you, Mr. Arvind. Uh, pleasure to be always been uh, uh, talking on this subject, which is very, very important. I just would like to know how much minutes do you have? Uh, uh, 10 minutes is normally the presentation. Okay. 10 minutes. Okay, and, uh, fine, fine. I'll try to uh, finish it within that as much as possible. 
Hey, uh, thank you for, for attending today. And I'm going to talk today about mainly on Toyota Mobility Vision, uh, because that is a topic which I would like to, uh, we have been asked to talk about. Uh, what is the Toyota's uh, fuel cell electric vehicle journey, hydrogen society? Particularly, I would like to explain about in Japan being in Toyota's uh, the motherland. And of course, the uh, probably I can skip uh, number four because we've been talking uh, since morning on this subject quite heavily. Uh, I think everybody knows that this is a global issue of 20, 21st century. I think CO2 is a very important contributor uh, for the global warming, and all of us has been equally uh, concerned for this. And what we recognize since we came from the automotive sectors, I think uh, is very important that the transport sector is a uh, one of the major contributors to the CO2 emission, which is almost about 14%. So it becomes our prime responsibility to support this uh, prospective, and that is why Toyota have uh, had their own clear vision and the mission on 2050. Uh, the key mission which we need to talk about is mainly about how to uh, make zero 90% uh, CO2 uh, reduction by 2050 uh, through all our product and the processes. And that's what our commitment uh, uh, towards the environment uh, cause. Uh, as you know that the Toyota is focused uh, mainly wherever we do the business, what exactly uh, the locally available material energy and from the sustainability point of view. It is not we would like to work on that, but depending on the region, uh, which region has been uh, influenced or what kind of energy source and how can we support in that particular region for those technology. And that's the reason Toyota has been having all diversified technology right from the hybrid electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, battery electric vehicle, uh, FC EV, and of course, uh, in case of biofuel also. Uh, so depending on the region, uh, I think the technology can be suitable. It's also very important, I'm not talk about the customer requirement because eventually how do you make sure that what need a customer is depending on the, his uh, experience of driving, whether he runs around uh, short kilometers per uh, kind of kilometers or he long region, I think some of my colleague explained earlier. So depending on the application, the usage, how can you make sure that which technology should be uh, supportive in that case? So there is no one power train can support to all the aspect of the customer. That's the reason we have a very clear portfolio and product range uh, right from the smaller uh, traveling distance, like a small battery electrical vehicle, and if you look at the moderate around, uh, let's say, 200, 300 kilometers per uh, overall, uh, you can use a plug-in hybrid or the hybrid. And if you have the long duration, the heavy commercial vehicle, you can always use the hydrogen as a uh, kind of uh, energy source. So uh, we created all the vehicles and powertrain to suitable to the, uh, the customer uh, requirement. Very important that how do you standardize? How can we make the most competitive. So as you know, all the technology, particularly whether it is battery electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid or the hydrogen vehicle, there is a common commodity, which is a motor battery and the power control unit can be used uh, across all the technology. And there are a unique uh, requirement depending on the uh, kind of uh, you know, scale characteristic of the vehicle. So we, what does it mean that? how to standardize the common use and we can uh, that can help us in economy of scale and then the, we can always make it affordability. So it is not uh, important just to have a technology, but how to make it more uh, impactful and uh, affordable. Uh, with that today, uh, this is the latest information which we took that we could sell as on today about more than about 20 million car by this uh, last fiscal year and which has improved almost 139 million CO2 reduction. So we are in the uh, our path about our mission. And with this understanding, our vision is that what would be the our product lineup uh, compared to the all electrified technology, and which is very important for us to reach our goal of 2050. So Toyota believes in orderly transition for all technology is important. And I think every tech, uh, every uh, kind of region should be having technology agnosticism so that we can able to really make our objective in a very clear way. So that's all about the first perspective on the Toyota as a whole mobility vision. And let me quickly go about uh, the FCV development. As you know, that Toyota has first started uh, probably in 1992. Uh, and the first Mirai in uh, 2014, and then uh, these are the kind of lineup which we went, and then today we're having almost uh, generation two uh, for the uh, overall uh, Mirai perspective. 
Uh, you maybe understand that as I explained to you, uh, the, this is a core hybrid technology as I explained uh, to you as a, uh, you know, HEV technology is very important is the hydrogen tank and FC tank would be the add on and that thereby we can always use a common parts from the, the electrified uh, as a technology perspective. This is a new generation uh, which has been launched last year and uh, it has been significant improvement in terms of cost as well as the performance and that's we are really and one filling of the cylinder can cover more than 1000 kilometers per uh, per filling, particularly in the cylinder. So that's the kind of the performance has come out quite uh, significantly. Uh, it's also been comply or uh, meets all the global safety regulation and it's been utmost taken care on whatever the uh, requirement or the myth uh, with the customer has it's been covered on those aspects. Uh, in this year, we have a target of more than uh, so far we are 10,000 uh, uh, unit per Japan and this year we have a plan of 30,000 per year and I think as on uh, first quarter almost the because of pandemic situation as on July, we could sell around 4,128 globally uh, on the Mirai. Important as you say everybody is like uh, how, the, how can we make the hydrogen uh, uh, it's expensive sometimes and uh, is the production has been limited, refilling infrastructure limited and of course the fuel cell are still expensive. So what should be our uh, initiative in that? So we try to make that uh, uh, you know uh, kind of uh, action to increase the, the uh, uh, make it how to popularize the technology. Uh, we diversified our com uh, collaboration with the University Research Institute and many companies who, uh, from the various forms of mobility. Uh, as you know that Toyota uh, has already uh, made the royalty free license on the approximately 20,000, 23,000 patent for the electric uh, vehicle electrification related to technology. So we share this intellectual property for quicker spread of the technology so that whatever we spend time, the other need not to be spent and then we can always uh, make much better and quicker implementation of this technology. Uh, as I explained, we diversified the FCV not only for the only passenger car, but also commercial car and the industrial use. The more we popularize, uh, we will create the demand and thereby the hydrogen economy can become more competitive. And that is the basic thinking way about how we should uh, make sure that this kind of application can be widely used. Uh, just example, this is a, a kind of Europe. I think we introduced the Mirai taxi in Paris. 500 vehicles by end of 2020 was the last time mission. And I think these are the, some of the initiative where our counterpart. Just for giving the example, the heavy duty it creates the industry uh, increase because if you look at the one FC bus can create the requirement of 45 uh, uh, Mirai uh, requirement of the hydrogen. So how do you ensure the commercial vehicle also can support you in uh, kind of increase the hydrogen demand and thereby the entire, econo entire value chain can become more competitive. Uh, we also has been certain initiative globally. I'll not touch more the, as I think uh, we have been there in application uh, buses uh, in case of Futon and uh, in Europe, we also have a Kaitano buses. So we have been uh, collaborating with the various stakeholders in order to promote the entire technology. This is a very interesting uh, industrial application. How do you use end-to-end uh, -end solution? This is one of the our Toyota plant. Uh, where we use a uh, you know kind of uh, reusable renewable energy into the uh, fuel stack hydrogen and the same hydrogen can be used for the forklift or the material handling so this kind of uh, in the end to end solution from the sustainability point of view has been uh, quite uh, interesting uh, we also have some kind of uh, public partnership project uh, this is a project we are done with the uh, uh, 711 where we can use the entire uh, ecosystem end-to-end -end trial where we can use the hydrogen ecosystem. This is one of the initiatives to work on more uh, kind of perspective on overall uh, point of view. Uh, these are the project which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, just a minute. I just have to take a call. OK, sorry. Yeah, this is an integrated FC system module to fit in the compact space. And this is what we have been working with uh, one of the uh, you know, shipment and uh, working together to how to use this uh, kind of you know, uh, perspective or overall perspective. Same thing in order to make uh, fuel stack compatible. Uh, this is a kind of new initiative where uh, it can be used as an official uh, commodity 
so that you can just use and use different combination of fuel tank depending on the application. So fuel tank is available, ready to use, optional, and that can improve your application part, and uh, that will make some more uh, you know easy for any kind of promoting of those uh, technology in a totality. Uh, this is also one of the example like how you can use a Toyota fuel bus in you know, kind of sustainability point of view in case of uh, uh, you know power supply system which can be hydrogen can be converted into the electricity and then can be used for uh, such kind of a domestic application. That's uh, uh, even Toyota also has been working with the JR East Railway. Uh, that is a train project uh, development of the FCV and FC bus supporting this kind of hydrogen supply infrastructure. So these are the, some of the project which uh, we're talking. It's very important, which we are really proud of, the Toyota Woman City. All our experience of project of hydrogen, we use uh, Toyota Woman City, which demonstrate the mobility as autonomous energy, like carbon neutral hydrogen, FC, probably logistic and food and agriculture. So this is a kind of world first carbon neutral city in Japan and uh, complete energy sustainability towards the hydrogen has been uh, used in a different part of the application. This is worth uh, kind of having a showcase, and not only showcase, having a pilot city to understand how near future is going to look like in that perspective. So this is an area of uh, almost 50,000 square meter uh, as a whole, and could be the population around 2,000 will be there around this particular part of that, yeah. Uh, there are some future initiative which we are working and launch the huge uh, moon rover and this is something in the space area also looking at how we can able to contribute and make sure that the hydrogen able to you know, can be used as a point of uh, the energy perspective in overall uh, uh, collaboration. That's that's what I can tell you. I'm I have another two minutes quickly. I'll just put it upon what is the hydrogen society in Japan. I think everybody knows that uh, there is a kind of uh, overall the 2030, they had a very clear vision uh, about a full scale hydrogen uh, society in large volume. And uh, yeah, they set up the kind of uh, scaling the hydrogen dem demand. And currently, if you look at the uh, uh, renewable energy and converting the elect water electrolyzers and then uh, e utilizing for the application perspective. Uh, and of course, these are the kind of direction which they've been working uh, as a, in Japan. There's a very clear uh, target by Japan government by 2030, uh, how much should be the cost of the hydrogen, how much should be the power generation we need to have, and of course, what should be the mobility. So very clear to the, uh, direction and the KPI, so that every uh, kind of you know, ecosystem will be aligned to such kind of uh, national target uh, to make it happen. They also doing some kind of national project about renewable energy based hydrogen project. I think uh, I'll not take much time on that. But what I need to tell you through this that the government is quite actively involved in the national uh, nation level uh, kind of project, uh, which also have a kind of in, how to involve the uh, public partnership. And that's something uh, very important. This is another uh, project which they use. Uh, a kind of renewable energy uh, and then convert into the storage and transportation and probably use into the actual application. This is a very interesting project uh, in the kind of operation side that, that case. Yeah, so this is a one more project uh, which they transport the liquid hydrogen from Australia. This is a Japan and Australia and almost 9,000 kilometers. This is a, something unique uh, way of uh, unused brown coal which has been ga gasified in Australia and how can we move uh, such a long distance that's all that's all also the kind of the collaboration perspective there's also involvement how as a hydrogen council how to develop the ecosystem uh, this is equally important and uh, they also have the refueling station network uh, as kind of with automakers infrastructure company and the financial institute to work together and uh, these are the kind of roadmap which a different region, how many fuel stations should be established, et cetera, by 2020, and now it is getting revised now. And uh, this is a something kind of the each hydrogen roadmap in 2030 in Japan, China, Europe, and all. So several thousand of hydrogen stations is equally important because we can't just make the product, but also the entire ecosystem has to get developed accordingly. And that's how the kind of uh, the, the consultorium activity is happening. Well, so very I mean, important. Uh, yeah, I'll last slide and then I'll, I'll just come up from this. And this is very important that it cannot happen only by the end user, 
but the government, the demand side and the supplier side, all three work, uh, it can really make happen. And this is what the, uh, the, the case study we learn. And I think we also in India is promoting in a similar way. And I'm sure that a lot of talk we had like from the beginning uh, today morning. So, yeah, so that's all. I think I'll skip the, uh, the hydrogen society for India because we talk uh, much on this particular area. Uh, over to you, Mr. Ravin. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we will probably in the question and answer uh, section, se uh, session, we'll just uh, come back to maybe your, your thoughts on higher end society in India. But before, um, I think um, it's quite interesting that uh, the, 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 the first question I read uh, is from uh, Mr. Anand Vasudevan do, uh, to, to Mr. Roy. So why Japan is slowing down? Um, um, so that's actually this question is now to, to Mr. Roy. Could you please just uh, uh, answer this? So I've actually uh, put in my response. They have a supply challenge. They're really, you know, Japan doesn't have renewable energy. It's a very challenging terrain to have enough of renewable energy. They're not interested in nuclear power after Fukushima. They're looking at importing hydrogen from Australia. So they have a real supply issue. I think it's a different question what happened with the Olympics because they did have a certain plan there and they were not able to fully gear up to it. They had lots of challenges in the Olympics. Going forward, their hydrogen plan is very much on steam. The question is how do they get that hydrogen? How do they get green hydrogen? And personally, I believe they will have to look at options such as offshore wind, uh, you know, and nearer uh, shore kind of uh, options rather than shipping hydrogen across from Australia. But that's anybody's guess, you know. I think uh, uh, Mr. Dalvi might have a better picture on that because uh, you know he was talking about Japan's ecosystem. Uh, Mr. Dalvi, would you be so kind to add on? Uh, uh, no, you, yeah, you... I, I, yeah, sorry, I, I completely agree with Mr. Roy. I think the biggest challenge in Japan is that the hydrogen uh, uh, production and the availability of the hydrogen, and they have to depend on most of the overseas uh, kind of uh, perspective, and that's a kind of challenge. But the kind uh, one thing I must tell you that uh, their current way uh, and you know what exactly is important is that they don't limit it uh, only into the mobility sector. So they have been quietly diversifying the application of hydrogen in a various small project, national level project, and that brings a kind of the scale. And once you bring the scale, and then the the entire ecosystem is a viable, is a competitive, and that's exactly which I think probably we need to learn. And, and we are also taking in a similar direction. I think today morning also I had a, a, I uh, listened to Mr. Khan. I think similar perspective. So uh, I, I say it's a, it's a it's a kind of supply and demand. Probably. Uh, to be there and probably LBM or any uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of application, and then thereby we could able to balance that perspective. That's what I can take it on. Uh, Mr. Dalvi, thank you very much. But then um, uh, your last slide. So because of time, probably we we could go through. Would you be so kind to extend, uh, say, how to build this in, in a hydrogen community in India, also learning from the Japan experience? Yeah, uh, I I can tell you that. Uh, Probably we have a biggest advantage, and I think, uh, uh, sorry, I couldn't explain my complete presentation. Uh, there is a from the uh, our biomass, or the in case every region has an advantage of the energy source. Probably India, uh, since we all been having struggling for the, the crude oil. Point of view, but I would say hydrogen is a, a kind of uh, the best to work on uh, because our potential option is relatively as an energy so much more better. Uh, secondly, you, you are been having electricity plus going to be a uh, lot of renewable energy is going to get uh, with a source where we can store where we can you know kind of perspective and uh, I think the hydrogen would be a much more. Uh, the likely to be way forward uh, to uh, you know address those perspectives. So I I still feel that uh, we have opportunity. The issue what we will have only the perspective on the application part, you know uh, kind of technology like the we are talking about electrolyzer because where there is a more on the application or the uh, hardware story comes. 
probably that's area we may have to take some more time for us to develop in a, it's a long way to go but uh, probably production of hydrogen and etc the basic infrastructure and the input probably we are having much more higher advantage in that perspective thank you thank you very much thank you very much then i have a question to mr happena um, especially with with the fleet management experience and uh, knowing the importance of managing the whole fleet uh, do you also see uh, opportunities for a collaboration with IT industry in, in that sense, or do you see such opportunities for future? Yes, think yes. I think that cross-sectional um, collaboration is extremely important because when you look at the fleet management, I think it's a whole um, optimization of the fleet and the ecosystem around it. You know, so to I can give you. I cannot give you a general answer, but I think uh, the point is completely valid, and I think uh, this kind of cross-sectional collaboration will extend in the future. You know, between vehicle focus, um, energy supply focus, and also the IT section on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then I have a question to Mr. Nanda. Uh, with the with the Heisen Motors also showing interest in uh, aerospace industry. Uh, and and Cochin uh, Airport is the, the first airport in the world uh, fully depending upon uh, green power. But also, uh, I'm, I'm at Groningen, and Groningen, actually, we are actually trying to convert it to an all-electric airport. Even uh, there are people thinking of an, a hydrogen airline or all-electric airline starting from Groningen. So what are your thoughts on Heisen and how we could work together in Kerala, but also in Groningen? So uh, Hyzon is already supplying to an unnamed uh, but reasonably high profile uh, aerospace, uh, let's say, startup. So airline startup. Uh, the 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 story is, is quite exciting. So we you know we we have the capability. So Hyzon has a single stack, for example, that will be uh, available in 2022 and beyond for uh, 370 kilowatts. So for example, for a heavy duty truck, you need less than 150. So if you had uh, a you know, 370. You can imagine the the advantage to to heavy duty applications. Uh, so we are we are quite excited to explore um, uh, aeronautical applications. Uh, we do note that uh, given the you know general let's say safety regulatory roadmap, it, it's some way away. So uh, so we are a little bit uh, let's say you know watching with interest, and and we are also engaging with the industry. But uh, we've not seen uh, a lot of let's say opportunities to. To have a meaningful engagement, either uh, I should also add Hyzon. Uh, so our parent company Horizon has a, another spin-off called H3 Dynamics, which is already doing, for example, drones, etc. So we we have more than one finger in this pie. Just to be clear. Uh, thank.